Welcome. Be sure to like and subscribe for more scary stories. Or I will come for you. Today's stories are original tales, handwritten by the curator. Listen, if you dare. Enjoy. Story number one. This is gonna be a tough one to get through. If you're squeamish or easily disturbed, do yourself a favor and just don't read any further. But if you have the stomach for the truly messed up shit, then buckle up. I gotta get this insane story off my chest. It all started back when me and my boy Caleb were stupid kids, fresh out of high school and dreaming big about our futures as artists. We were both really into the underground scene. Street art, sprays, that whole counterculture aesthetic, you know. Looking back now, we were just a couple of pretentious punks thinking we were gonna change the world with our visionary perspectives. Anyway, one of the things that really bonded us was taking the plunge and getting our first tattoos together on our 18th birthdays. We went to this crusty little shop and each got these matching winged serpents inked across our shoulder blades. Symbolic of our soaring creative ambitions and forbidden knowledge or some dumb shit like that. But it felt meaningful at the time, like forging a permanent brotherhood. Fast forward a few years, and we're rooming together in this grungy apartment downtown, taking classes at the local art college, but still heavily steeped in the DIY fringe. Putting out our own little zines and painting guerrilla murals on abandoned buildings around the city. We were pretty much inseparable finding inspiration in each other and pushing our crafts into wilder, more boundary-pushing directions. Of course, once you become a part of that underground community, you also get exposed to the even deeper, darker underbellies of the scene. Porn, hard drugs, hacking and cybercrime, the black markets for contraband and hardcore shit that never sees the light of day. Know what I mean? It started with us, just dipping our toes into those murkier waters out of curiosity. Seeing what kind of messed up, transgressive art people were cooking up in the hidden corners of the web, we found this whole world of different online forums, blogs, and stores specializing in super fucked up stuff like hardcore scat porn or crime scene photography just totally depraved and taboo. At first, we were like, whoa, people are into this shit. Like, actually buying and selling this crazy exploitation stuff. But then the more we looked into it, the more we started to understand the viewpoints and mentalities behind that shadow world. They saw it as true artistic freedom in its purest form. No moral restrictions, no limits. No censorship, just raw expression of humanity's sickest depths. Now I know what you're thinking. Jesus, you guys were into some sick twisted shit. And yeah, I can't really argue that point. Our minds got pretty warped during that phase, and the art we started making took a much darker turn. But try to understand it from our naive perspective at the time. We were just dumb kids chasing that philosophy of no artistic boundaries, you know? Taking it way too far without thinking of the human consequences. Like, one of the first really messed up things we ordered online was this blood paint set from some shop on the dark web that advertised using actual human blood pigments and binders. Looking back, it was so obviously an illegal scam but we thought it was just part of the whole underground thing at the time. So we started doing these gnarly ass paintings that looked like they were made with period blood or something. We'd put in orders for fresh typo negative or whatever and get these suspicious plastic baggies of dark red liquid in the mail a week later. We'd pour them straight onto the canvases and smear them around into hellish, nightmarish visions of erotic body horror. Fucked up shit for sure, but we saw it as daring artistic statements. 
After a year or two of pursuing this, no limits aesthetic and plugging ourselves deeper into the hidden art world, even the blood paint thing wasn't enough to satisfy our depravity. We wanted to find new extremes to mutate our styles. So we started looking into weirder and weirder online forums and shops, trying to uncover new tabor to alchemize into our visionary work. That's when we discovered the specimen stores. I guess that's the best way to describe them. Only accessible through the deepest onion routing and encryption, these sites advertised mail order services for, well, human body parts and remains. Everything from diseased organs to full skeletons to preserve deformed fetuses floating in jars. And beyond even that, into the realms of, shall we say, ethically sourced offerings. At first, I swear we were just morbidly curious. Who the hell would even think to sell this kind of shit? And to whom? But then we started looking at the galleries and portfolios showcasing artwork made from these ungodly materials. Sculptures assembled from bone and viscera, paintings infused with bodily fluids and chromosomes, even fucking furniture upholstered in tanned human skin and hair. And we started thinking, how far can you really take bodily art before it becomes sacred rather than profane? If you distill the essence of humanity's physical form down to its raw components and media, is that the truest way to capture organic expression? To rend yourself open and expose the nerve? So, yeah, we took the plunge and started ordering samples from the sites. Vials of anonymous blood, urine, excretions, organs suspended in fetid brine solutions, even a fucking femur or two to experiment with. Try gouging into the bone marrow and mixing it with acrylics for a sick fossilized effect. We were like mad scientists obsessively trying to formulate the most profane and visceral art imaginable. Now I really hesitate to even recount this next part, but what's done is done, I guess. We started investing more money into this twisted practice, delving back into untraceable darknet finances to purchase more. Complete donor specimens to use, whether they were willingly donated or otherwise. We tried not to think about that part too hard, it's surreal in hindsight, but we'd literally have, like, severed heads or torso chunks getting shipped to us in styrofoam biohazard coolers, and we'd treat them as objects of art. Reference materials to try different techniques, unlike tattooing directly into the desiccated flesh or stuffing them and piercing artificial appendages through the membranes. Just beyond fucked up shit. But we saw it as like our sacred duty to transmute the profane into the sublime. At least that's how we justified it to ourselves, you know. Anyway, I guess in retrospect, this was all escalating way too far out of control. We'd pretty much abandoned all ethical reasoning and thought nothing of ordering partial corpses through these blackest of black markets. And desecrating them for art. Caleb, in particular, really seemed to lose his grip on reality during this time. He got more obsessive, reclusive, talking non-stop about needing to go further. I don't know if he ever got any shipments without me around, but I wouldn't put it past him with how unhinged he was acting. Then one day, after I hadn't heard from him in like a week, he just kinda vanished. His bedroom door was ajar. Bed sheets, a tangled mess, and art supplies strewn everywhere like a hoarder's nest. No sign of him or any evidence he'd been harmed. His phone was gone, and there was cash missing from his stash, so I figured maybe he'd just split town on some kind of soul-searching art pilgrimage. Or maybe the shipments had finally caught up with him legally. I don't know. Well, 
A couple weeks after he went missing, I got back from a night of bartending to find a large wooden crate sitting outside the apartment door. No return address or anything. When I pried it open, I saw a huge rolled up canvas wrapped in brown paper. At first, I thought maybe it was just Caleb fucking with me, sending one of his twisted masterpieces through the mail to screw with my head. But when I really looked closer and noticed, certain patterns in the material, an awful, disturbing realization started creeping over me. It was unmistakably human skin. A massive fucking canvas made from stretched and cured human dermis. And there, plain as day, the tattoo we'd both gotten as kids. A serpentine monster with wings unfurled and fangs bared across the expanse of its scaly spine. That matching winged serpent piece we'd marked ourselves forever with years ago. Staring back at me, deadly still and pliant across what could only be the hollowed out remains of my best friend's harvested fucking tissue. I was so stunned and nauseated, I could barely process what was happening. But then I saw a plain, unmarked envelope tucked inside the wrappings of the fuck. I can barely even say it. The skin canvas he'd been shrink-wrapped and shipped to me in. With trembling hands, I ripped it open to find a short, handwritten note inside. Your work yearns for its grand piece to resist ants. Take up the brush and let his essence sing eternal across the tainted veinscapes. He always was the lesser of your pair, ever meant for flaying to pave the masterwork awaited low these years. I, Jesus Christ, I don't even know how to end this. Part of me thinks publishing this whole story is just an idiotic risk if any of the gnarled fucks from those seen world underbellies get wind of it. But I have to try and let people know what dangers are lurking out there in the blackest pits of human creation. As for the canvas, I've kept the package unopened and hidden away in a storage unit for now. Maybe one day when I finally rid myself of these haunting memories for good, I'll crack it open and do as the note commands. Dip my brushes into Caleb's essence and unleash our final depraved masterwork upon the world. But for now, I'll have to keep on living with the knowledge that my best friend was so consumed by art's most sacrilegious aspects that he allowed his physical being to become the magnum opus itself. I'm so, so sorry, brother. Story number two. It all started a few months ago when my husband of 15 years, Frank, told me he was leaving me. I remember the night, like it was yesterday. I had just finished cleaning the apartment for the third time that day. I have this thing where I can't stop cleaning when I get started. It calms my nerves. Anyway, Frank came through the door looking all disheveled and sad. Before I could even ask him what was wrong, he blurted out, Jen, I'm leaving. I've met someone else. Those words crushed me. I thought we were doing okay. Sure, we hadn't been as intimate lately, but I thought that was normal for a couple our age. He's 52, and I'm 48. I immediately broke down crying, asking him over and over why he would do this to me. But he just kept saying I have to go. She's the one and stumbled back out the door. I crumpled to the floor, sobbing. I must have laid there for hours. For the first few weeks, I could barely function. I missed work, stopped cleaning, and barely ate anything. I just laid on the couch, staring at the TV for days on end. Every little thing would remind me of Frank and set off another bout of uncontrollable crying. Like hearing a commercial for a restaurant we used to go to or seeing someone wearing one of his favorite baseball caps. It was total torment. At night, I would wake up in a panic looking for him, only to remember he was gone. The empty spot next to me in bed just made me feel more alone than ever. 
Sometimes, I'd find little things he left behind, like an old toothbrush or a crumpled receipt in his pant pocket, and I'd break down all over again, holding that item and crying until I had no tears left. I tried going out, like my friend Susan suggested, but it was no use. Everywhere I went, I saw happy couples, and it rubbed salt in the wound. I considered ending it all a few times. I was so miserable, but I kept going for my family. I'm an only child, and my parents have passed, so my family is pretty small. But they needed me, or so I told myself. After a couple months of this sadness and solitude, something started to change in me. I don't know if it was watching too much TV or what, but I became paranoid. I started checking every door and window locks three or four times before going to bed. I'd get up in the middle of the night to recheck them. I stopped opening the mailbox for days because I thought there might be a bomb inside. It was totally irrational, but I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was going to break in and get me. Around this time, I started exploring the dark corners of the internet. I know, I shouldn't have gone there, but I was so lonely and it was something to do. At first, it was mostly just joining Reddit communities, but then I found these private chat rooms and started talking to people there. They were the kind of folks you'd never want to meet in real life. Scammers, creeps, dealers, and worse. But. I felt understood by them, like we were all lonesome outcasts banded together. They didn't judge my obsessive behaviors or think I was weird. We were the dregs of society, and that felt strangely comforting. There were a lot of trolls and toxic people in those chat rooms, but I started to tune them out. Instead, I focused on a few strangers who seemed to really get me. There were zombie eyes. A hacker from Russia who loved anarchy and chaos. He turned me on to some messed up stuff on the dark web. 666 Soul was this Satanist from England who said she could see ghosts, demons, and energy fields. And then there was Acid Bath from somewhere in the US. He or she loved splatter films and serial killer documentaries. Those people became my new friends. My new family, almost. We'd chat for hours about our twisted thoughts, darkest secrets, and haunting fears. I'll admit, some of the stuff they shared turned my stomach, but I was too far down the rabbit hole to stop. Plus, I felt such a bond with them, like they truly understood the sickness inside me. As time went on and my new internet friends became my whole life, I started doing things Things I'm not proud of. Acid Bath turned me on to eliminating toxicity in your life, as she called it. She talked about how most people are purely negative forces who drain others. I agreed. Having experienced so much pain and hurt from my ex and others over the years, Acid Bath said there was a way to cleanse the negativity from your soul by permanently removing the toxic people from your life. At first, I thought she just meant cutting them out, going no contact or something. But she kept making strange comments about melting away the filth and cleansing negativity through chemistry. I pushed her for answers and she finally revealed her process to me one day in an audio chat. She told me in a hushed, almost reverent tone that she had a special bathtub that she used to purify toxic people. She would lure them to her house somehow, knock them out with chloroform. From there, she slowly dissolved their bodies in a potent acid mix she had concocted. She claimed it was the only way to permanently cleanse their negativity from the world. At first, I was totally shocked and disgusted. I didn't think she was serious, but the more she described the look of peace on their faces as they transcended, the more intrigued I became. She said it was her way of hitting the reset button on humanity, one toxic person at a time. I'll admit, it sounded cathartic, 
like it could be the answer to purging all the heartache and negativity I had endured. That night, I had a dream that I was in a warm bath, and all the hurt from Frank leaving, all my bitterness and anger, was just melting off me and swirling down the drain. When I woke up, I felt different. Like I suddenly had clarity for the first time in months. I knew what I needed to do. Over the next few weeks, I started planning. I ordered a heavy-duty bathtub from a specialty renovation store and had it installed. I told the workers I was redoing the bathroom. Then I acquired the chemicals Acid Bath told me about through some. Let's call them alternative channels. I won't go into detail, but let's just say they weren't bought at Home Depot. While I was prepping, I re-familiarized myself with the toxic people who had hurt me over the years. High school bullies, horrible ex-friends and boyfriends, even former co-workers and neighbors. I made a list, tracked them down online, and started choosing my first guests. I knew I had to be careful, but I was too far gone at that point. Eliminating negativity had become my sole purpose. The first one was probably the hardest. It was this guy named Kyle, who was a few years younger than me. We went on a couple dates back in the day, and he ended up being a total supreme jerk. He led me on for months, love-bombed me, got me to pay for everything, then laughed in my face and said I was desperate and would never find anyone. What a toxic piece of garbage. Anyway, through some admittedly unethical internet stalking, I found out Kyle still lived in the same crappy Brooklyn apartment. I waited until I knew he would be home based on his patterns, put on one of those stupid fake delivery guy costumes, and rang his bell. When he opened it, I sprayed this chloroform junk in his face, and he went down like a sack of potatoes. I was shocked at how easy it was. Honestly, I dragged his body back to my place, stripped off his clothes, and put him in the tub. He started coming too, as I poured in the acid mix, so I had to hold him down. He was screaming at first, but then, an odd calm came over him. Like Acid Bath said, there was this look of total peace that washed over his face. Within about 30 minutes, his body had completely dissolved into this greenish-brown sludge. I let it drain, said a little prayer, and felt reborn. That gnawing voice of negativity in my head that had been with me since Frank left, since I was a child really, was gone. All the bitterness and hurt had melted away along with Kyle's toxic essence. I felt euphoric, reborn, and I knew I had to keep going to maintain that clarity. There were so many other negative forces out there poisoning the world. Over the next few months, I repeated the process several more times, each one getting easier than the last. An old friend from high school who bullied me for being poor. A horrible neighbor who was rude to everyone. A former boss who made my life hell. A boyfriend from years ago who hit me once. With each cleansing, the weight became lighter. I was erasing the negativity from my past one acid bath at a time. My new dark web friends were so supportive, especially acid bath. She, uh, gave me tips on sourcing chemicals and finding targets. She acted as my mentor through this transformation which she called the purification. To everyone else, I probably looked like a slightly deranged shut-in. But to my true internet family, I was attaining a higher plane of existence by creating a negativity-free universe. I don't want to glorify what I've done or seem like a monster. It was an extreme answer to extreme hurt and negativity, that's all. Just thinking of Frank and his betrayal, the years of cruel bullying, the abuse I endured. It's enough to make someone snap. Once I discovered the path to cleansing those negative forces, I couldn't stop until I felt true peace. 
I'm a survivor, doing what needed to be done to eliminate toxicity, negativity, and hurt from this world. We'd all be a lot better off if we looked inward, faced our darkness, and underwent a purification. It's the only way to truly become reborn. Sometimes, the new version of yourself feels fucking glorious. Story number three. I never thought something like this could happen to a normal guy like me. But I swear on my life that every word of what I'm about to tell you is 100% true. It's the kind of messed up shit you hear about on true crime shows, but never think will happen to you. It started pretty innocent. Like a lot of bad things, do I guess. I was just a 22-year-old dude living in Brooklyn, working a mediocre job and spending way too much time on the internet. I'm kind of a shy, awkward guy, so I didn't really have any close friends or a girlfriend. Most nights, I'd just hang out alone at home browsing Reddit and YouTube after work. One night, I stumbled across this subreddit for sharing creepy videos and stories. I'm kind of a horror movie junkie, so I got hooked on reading all the freaky posts. A lot of it was probably made up, but some of the stories from people claiming to have experienced the events themselves seemed way too vivid and disturbing to be fake. There were videos of people torturing animals, photos of gruesome crime scenes, first-hand accounts of being stalked or witnessing murders. I know it's super messed up, but I couldn't get enough of that shocking, cringe-worthy stuff. It made my boring life seem exciting in comparison. After being a lurker on the subreddit for a few months, I finally got the courage to make a post asking if anyone had any particularly gnarly video clips to share. A few people replied with some nasty links, but one person messaged me privately. Her username was BloodDemon666. She said she was also really into dark, disturbing content and asked if I wanted to chat more. At first, I thought she was probably a creepy older dude trying to catfish me. But then we started video chatting and I realized she was an actually attractive goth chick around my age. Her name was Samara and she had long black hair with dark makeup and black nail polish. I know that's kind of a cliche look, but she definitely pulled it off well. We really hit it off, talking about all the sickest horror movies, true crime documentaries, and messed up videos we'd seen online. After a few weeks of chatting almost every night, I was pretty sure Samara was for real and not just some psycho troll messing with me. She said she lived in Manhattan and invited me to meet up in person for coffee. Part of me thought it could be a setup to get robbed or killed by some crazy person. But my interest was too piqued to back out. We met up at this goth cafe in the East Village, and I could tell right away that she was genuinely into all the dark, disturbing stuff she had claimed to be into online. Sam was wearing this long black dress with weird symbols on it, and her nails were painted with little drops of red nail polish that looked like blood. As we sipped our coffee and snacked on these red velvet cupcakes, we bonded over our mutual fascination with the most bone-chilling, depraved videos and stories we'd encountered online. An outsider overhearing our conversation probably thought we were the biggest pair of freaks or psychopaths or something. But for two horror fans like us, it was just like sports fans enthusiastically discussing their favorite moments from games. Except, instead of celebrated plays, we were reminiscing over things like security cam footage of botched robberies that ended in gruesome deaths or surveillance videos of scared kids being snatched right off the street. Even though our shared interests were pretty twisted, I felt an intense connection and comfort talking to Samara that I'd never experienced before with anyone else. She was the first person I'd met who really got me and could relate to my highly disturbing fascinations. After that first meetup, Sam and I started hanging out regularly. 
We'd go to horror film festivals, haunted house attractions, recreation of crime scene museums, you name it. As long as it involved indulging in other people's misery and suffering, we were all about it. The first few months of knowing her, I think I was honestly just so psyched to have finally met someone I clicked with. Such a strong bond that I didn't really think too much about how unhealthy it was to be so obsessed with such disturbing subject matter. We were just having fun being horror fans, right? But then things started getting, let's just say increasingly out of hand. It began with me showing Samara this gory Reddit video that had been circulating of a woman getting her head smashed in with a hammer by her jealous boyfriend. Looking back, I'm disgusted that I got a sick thrill out of Samara's ghoulish delight while watching it. After that, we started actively looking for new sources to feed our twisted cravings. Samara knew a lot of crazy people skilled at hacking and getting into places online they shouldn't be. Thanks to her connections, we started getting access to horrifying content way too gnarly for the casual Reddit user. We're talking full video documentation of cartel hits, underground snuff films, you name it. I still get nauseous thinking about some of the brutal things we'd watch people do to each other. But at the time, I rationalized it as just keeping an open mind about understanding the most depraved corners of humanity. Somehow, that mindset made sense to me in my sick state back then. Samara and I even started our own private community to share the most messed up content and chat with other like-minded people into this stuff. We called ourselves the Black Circle and recruited new members carefully. Only the most committed sickos could gain access to our channels. And once you were in, there was a steady flow of horror to consume 24-7. It was like mainlining darkness directly into our brains. Looking back, I have no idea how I let myself get pulled into something so disturbing and shameful. By this point, Samara and I had fallen into a twisted cycle, feeding off each other's unhealthy obsessions and escalating them to more and more extreme lows. Our dates went from cinemas to stalking people out in public. From true crime museums to us staging our ownest violent scenarios. I'm honestly terrified to get too deep into the details because the memories haunt me every single day now. And the most horrifying part of all, part of me knew it had gone too far, but I was in way too deep with Samara. I was in love with her unique brand of darkness in the sickest way possible. We had crossed over into a point of no return. I think we both knew that even if we stopped, something was broken inside of us that could never go back to living a normal life. We had become addicted to indulging in the most twisted, inhumane behavior. The only way to get our fix was by continuing to descend together into further depravity. And that's what made Valentine's Day 2022 inevitable. I wish I could say I had no clue what Samara was planning that night, that it took me completely by surprise. But the truth is, Part of me was fully prepared and willing to go along with it, no matter how inhumane her surprise was. When she told me she had a special gift planning for our date night that evening, as sick as I was at the time, I could sense it was going to be next level. Sure enough, when I showed up at her place in Lower Manhattan, she was waiting for me dressed in this tight black latex dress that looked straight out of a slasher flick. As soon as I got inside, Samara grabbed me by the arm firmly and led me downstairs to her basement. I figured maybe she had set up some freaky, kinky sex dungeon as her gift or something. As perverted as that would normally be, by this point, it honestly wouldn't have been the sickest thing we'd done. But when she opened the heavy metal door leading into the basement, the horror that awaited me was so much more twisted and depraved than I could have imagined. 
There in the center of the room, illuminated by a single flickering light bulb, was a man tied up. His hands were chained above his head, attached to a wooden beam like some sick pillory device. His feet were shackled into the concrete floor below him with chains that looked like they belonged in a medieval dungeon. The dude couldn't have been older than 30 and was stripped down to his underwear. His face was badly beaten, nose and lips split open and gushing blood down his chin. One eye was already swollen shut. As soon as I locked eyes with him, my heart sank, and I instantly started shaking with terror. But as messed up as it sounds, part of me also had this dark curiosity to see where this was going. That side of my brain had been poisoned to the point that encountering this depraved scenario made me more intrigued than afraid, if I'm being fully honest with myself. Samara didn't say a word at first. She slowly walked around behind the bound man and stood there, smiling at me like the Cheshire Cat. Then she slowly bent forward and I saw her grab something on the floor with her hand before standing back upright. When she turned around to face me, she was clutching one of those small handheld axes you use for throwing at targets. By this point, my adrenaline was surging, my hands were trembling and I could feel sweat starting to trickle down my forehead. But I still couldn't peel my eyes away from what Samara did next. Wielding the axe up over her shoulder, she whipped her arm forward, launching the sharp axe head spinning straight towards the head of the bound man. If you've never witnessed someone get hit with an axe at point-blank range before, it's one of those sounds that sticks with you forever. The way the metal wedge sliced into the guy's face with a dull, meaty thud ripping through his cheek and lodging into his jawbone. The way the splatter of blood sprayed out in a thick mist of crimson drops, like a gory special effect from a slasher film. I'll never forget the guttural animalistic screams of sheer agony he let out, or the sight of the blood pooling out of his face and dripping down his chest. I think part of me died inside watching that unfold right in front of me. But the other part, the twisted part Samara had awakened over time, felt a rush of excitement at witnessing something so heinously disturbing. She slowly made her way back around to face me again, her black dress splattered with the guy's blood now. But she didn't seem phased at all. In fact, she had this lustful smile on her face her tongue licking the blood speckled across her plump black lip. Then she bent down and retrieved another small axe, giving me this deranged want a turn look with her eyes. That snapped me out of my trance, and I bolted for the stairs leading back upstairs, gasping for air and struggling to make sense of what I'd just seen. How could this be happening? Who was that man? And how had this become my new reality? It was too much for me to process. But before I could even reach the stairwell, I heard Sam's voice sternly yell out behind me. If you try to leave right now, I'll kill you too. I froze in my tracks at those words and slowly wheeled around to face her. She was armed with another ax in her hand, a dead serious glare locked on me not a hint of jest to her threat. Now come over here and let's show our friends some more Valentine's Day hospitality. If you really love me, you'll join me on this, she menacingly purred. Something inside me cracked. I think I felt whatever shred of human decency still remained in my soul. Extinguish in that moment when I started walking towards Samara and the axe in her hands. I saw the flashes of surprise and fear in the man's one open eye as I slowly made my way towards them. When I was standing by Samara's side, she smiled and rested her blood-soaked hand against my cheek in a twisted romantic gesture. Then she leaned in and planted a deep, forceful kiss onto my lips, our tongues swirling together. I tasted the metallic tang of the man's blood smeared across her mouth and to my horror, it made me ravenous to join Sam in inflicting more brutality.
I pulled back from our kiss, looked a frantic man dead in his terrified eye, and deviously grinned. Then Samara handed me an axe of my own, and we took turns burying them into his skull, one by one. The sickening sound of the blades cracking through bone and splashing blood across our faces. I've never felt so thrilled yet so revolted with myself at the same time as in those moments. Everything inside of me was screaming that this was beyond crossing a line into evil. That this made me a remorseless monster, just as bad as Samara. But my mind was too twisted to fight the compulsions any longer. When the man's lifeless corpse finally hung limp from its restraints, we collapsed into each other's arms right in front of it, kissing passionately and smearing each other with his drying blood. That's when I truly understood the depth of depravity we had allowed ourselves to sink into. It felt amazing. This is The Curator. I hope you've enjoyed today's scary stories. Until next time.